Bonan matenon. Hodiaŭ mi priparolas la idan lingvon en Novjorko. Esperanton comprenas ĉiuj, ĉu ne? Just kidding. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> Today I'll be talking about Yiddish in New York. Who here knows some Yiddish? A few words. <clears throat> if you know English or another European language, you might be familiar with several dozen Yiddish words. If you lived in New York, you probably uh, know even more. <clears throat> uh, a recent study showed that having lived in New York was a significant factor in the use of words of Yiddish origin, even when other factors, like being Jewish or having Jewish friends, were factored out. In a recent interview by The Forward, President Barack Obama, uh, who lived in Manhattan for a couple years while attending Columbia, was, act, was asked what he likes on his bagel. His answer, locks and capers are okay, but generally just your basic schmear. <laughs> Three words from Yiddish, bagel, locks, and schmear, in one question and answer, not bad. Growing up in New York in an Orthodox Jewish household, I absorbed hundreds of Yiddish words, phrases, and calques through the variety of Jewish English that we spoke at home. But all that is, of course, Yiddish-inflected English, not Yiddish. I wasn't able to put together a single Yiddish sentence until I started learning the language at the age of 20. Today, Yiddish is the language I speak the most with my friends and colleagues. And it's from this perspective that I'm going to uh, examine the following questions. Who speaks Yiddish today in New York? Why do they speak Yiddish? And how do they maintain the use of the language given the local and global dominance of English? But first, a few quick facts about the Yiddish language itself. This would be my concise definition. Uh, the traditional vernacular language of Ashkenazic Jewry. Let's unpack that. Ashkenazic. The Ashkenazim are an ethnic subgroup of the Jewish people. They began to coalesce in Central Europe about a thousand years ago. Ashkenaz was at one time a Hebrew word for Germany. In the 11th century, they composed an estimated 3% of the world's Jews. But by their peak in 1931, before the Holocaust, they accounted for 92% of all Jews in the world. Traditional. Although all Ashkenazic Jews today can trace their ancestry to Yiddish-speaking Jews, linguistic shift over the past two centuries, and of course the Holocaust, which destroyed the Yiddish-speaking communities of Europe, has led to Yiddish being a minority language among ethnically Ashkenazic Jews today. Vernacular. The traditional communities of Ashkenaz were and are not monolingual. In fact, they've always been internally trilingual. Hebrew and Aramaic are also languages of traditional Ashkenazim, along with the rest of the world's Jews. But the languages have different functions within the community. Hebrew and Aramaic are restricted to written and formulaic use, as opposed to Yiddish, which is spoken and read by everyone, hence the vernacular. Yiddish ended up being spoken over a very wide territory. At its peak between the 16th and 19th centuries, it had the second greatest expanse after, Russia, after Russian of any European language. A Jew could travel from Amsterdam to Bucharest to Kharkov to Riga and never have to switch languages. Genetically, Yiddish is classified as a high Germanic language. Here's the Indo-European language family. And that little bud over there is Yiddish. But the language also has major Semitic and Slavic components. This union of diverse elements inspired Yiddish scholar Max Weinreich to coin the term fusion language. Of course, there's no such thing as a pure language. But in some languages, such as Yiddish and English, the synthesis of multiple elements is particularly salient. On the other hand, sometimes I hear, oh, Yiddish. Uh, that's just a mixture of German, Hebrew, and Polish, right? I think that's like saying that the human body is just a mixture of oxygen, hydrogen, and carbon. It's sort of true, but it misses the point. 
Let's take an example sentence. Der Zayda kauft a Sefer. This means grandfather buys a holy book. Here we see the mixture of words from different components. Uh, Zayda, grandfather from Slavic, Sefer, book from Hebrew, and koift, buy, along with the function words from Germanic roots. A typical Yiddish sentence. However, if we try to mix around the components and make a sentence, der Greusvater is koine a knige, uh, where Greusvater is from German, koine from Hebrew, and knige from Slavic, then we get complete gibberish, not Yiddish. Uh, here's an example of a more subtle synthesis of different elements. This, uh, in the single term, untergangvenenzech, which means to sneak up on, we have morphemes originating from Germanic and Hebrew. Unter from German, ganv, uh, steel from Hebrew, and the rest also Germanic. But Slavic is also here under the surface. The combination of pieces uh, meaning under and steel with the reflexive to mean sneak up on somebody is a Slavic pattern, like in Russian, padkrasa. Uh, here's a different uh, kind of example. <clears throat> Sefer, uh, from the Hebrew word for book, and buch, from the Germanic word for book, are both words in Yiddish. However, Yiddish differentiates between these two. It might not be clear from the pictures, but uh, Sefer refers only to books on Jewish religious life, while Buch is reserved for those books on all other topics. This is a structural semantic distinction that's not made in either German or Hebrew. Another example, Hand from German refers to a regular hand, while Yad, which is the word for hand in Hebrew, is a traditional object used to point to the Torah scroll while it's being read in the synagogue. There are innumerable examples such as these where the fusion of components leads to possibilities not available in any of the source languages. <clears throat> yeah, that's right. Uh, Yiddish didn't begin making significant inroads into America until the 19th century. Advances in ship technology and the promise of economic opportunities led to a massive immigration of European Jews to America beginning in 1820. Targeted violence against Jews in Eastern Europe in the latter part of the century helped accelerate this immigration tenfold. Between 1881 and 1924, over two and a half million Jews moved to America. And while the first immigrants spread throughout the land to work as peddlers, later ones increasingly never left the city of New York. This wave of immigration ended abruptly in 1924 with the passage of the National Origins Act which set quotas for immigrants based on country of origin and was especially intended to stem immigration of Eastern European Jews and others who disrupted the ideal of American homogeneity. By that time, three million European Jews had passed through Ellis Island, the vast majority Yiddish speakers, with about half living in New York City alone. This is the Lower East Side of Manhattan when it was the most crowded neighborhood in the world and full of Yiddish speakers. Over a quarter of the city's population was Jewish, which goes a long way towards explaining the linguistic facts mentioned earlier. Uh, by the way, this building that used to house the Forwarts, a Yiddish newspaper, uh, that at its peak had a daily circulation of a quarter million, the highest uh, of any uh, non-English newspaper in America. It was also where my grandfather worked for 30 years as a typesetter. Today, after the murder of most of uh, Europe's Jews during World War II, and the repression of Yiddish in Israel and the Soviet Union, the New York metropolitan area has the most concentrated population of Yiddish speakers left in the world. This might actually make Yiddish a uniquely New York language today. I don't know of any other language whose major communities are in New York City. According to the most recent census data, Yiddish is the eighth most spoken language in New York State. This is a map of some of the largest concentrations of Yiddish speakers in the area. Down here, uh, we have the two major populations in Brooklyn. Here's a close-up of Brooklyn. 
The highlighted area in the south is the neighborhood of Borough Park, and in the north is Williamsburg. You can visit these today. <laughs> According to census data from the last few years, each has about 30,000 Yiddish speakers, though I suspect that that's an underestimate. Going back to the previous map, this point in upstate New York is Muncie, an area where, according to the census, almost half of residents over the age of five speak Yiddish at home, totaling about 10,000 speakers. The last two locations are possibly the most fascinating. These are two villages called Kyrgyz Yoel and New Square. In both, nearly the entire population is Yiddish speaking. We'll come back to them later. So who are these Yiddish speakers? While the enormous immigration wave of Yiddish speakers in the late 19th and early 20th century set the stage for New York as a Jewish city, practically none of the descendants of these immigrants speak Yiddish today. Instead, they followed the path of the vast majority of immigrants to the US and shifted to English within a generation or two. The same is true for most Jewish immigrants who have come to this country since then, including refugees from World War II. However, the Yiddish-speaking populations we just looked at, unlike almost all linguistic enclaves in America, are not comprised of mostly immigrants and their children. Instead, almost all are second, third, or even fourth generation Americans. But the dominance of Yiddish among them shows so far no sign of diminishing. How can we explain this phenomenon? The success of this language maintenance can partly be attributed to the influence of a single individual, Rabbi Yoel Teitelbaum. To understand where he came from, we have to go back to Hungary of the 1860s. Ready? At this time, most European Jews not only lived according to the precepts of Jewish law, but they also had components of what we would call culture, distinctive dress, names, literature, and of course, language. For centuries, assimilation or acculturation as we know it today was practically unheard of. The only way for a Jew to join Gentile society was to convert, and this meant abandoning one's community and family. The Jews of Europe were subjected to restrictions regarding where they could live, special taxes, uh, taxes frequent expulsions, and other disadvantages. Thus, their separation from the Gentiles was due to forces from both within and without. At the end of the 18th century, two concurrent phenomena began to bring change to the state of affairs. One was the Jewish Enlight Enlightenment, a movement that advocated the adoption of European Enlightenment values and integration into non-Jewish European society. The motto was, a Jew at home and a person on the street. The second process, partially a result of the first, was the emancipation of Jews in various European countries. The French Revolu Revolution set this in mo motion with the emancipation of the Jews of France in 1791. Napoleon soon extended this to all Jews in the empire. Although he privately referred to Jews as the most despicable of mankind, he awarded them all the rights of Gentiles, but with a catch, that they abandoned their language their educational system, and other aspects of their traditional way of life. This soon became the model of emancipation in a number of other European countries who opposed the idea of a nation within a nation. Some Jews jumped at the chance to become equal citizens with the majority population, but others felt the price was too steep. Perhaps the most radical counter movement to the Jewish Enlightenment began in Hungary in the mid 19th century. According to this movement, which came to be known as Haredi Judaism, or usually by detractors as ultra-Orthodoxy, certain Jewish culture, cultural uh, characteristics that we mentioned previously, such as dress, names, and language, were put on almost equal footing with the Jewish law of millennia. In addition, the movement encouraged isolation, not only from non-Jews, but also from other Jews who compromised on the issue of acculturation. Teitelbaum was a descendant of a line of rabbis from this movement, part of a group of Haredi Jews called Hasidim. In his youth, in the early 20th century, Teitelbaum moved to a city in Transylvania called Satu Mare, in Yiddish, Satmar, and eventually became chief rabbi of the city. During the war, Teitelbaum narrowly escaped death at the hands of the Nazis, while nearly all of his followers in Satmar perished. He arrived in America in 1947, 
Settling in the neighborhood of Williamsburg, Brooklyn, he set to work rebuilding the Satmar Hasidic community. There were almost no survivors from Satmar, but he drew followers from survivors who had belonged to other Hasidic groups in Galicia, Hungary, Romania, and Slovakia. In addition to the enclave in Williamsburg, Teitelbaum founded the village of Kiryas Yoel, named after himself, as a way of bringing his Hasidim to a place that was more secluded from outside influences, while still near the commercial center of New York. Starting from a group of several dozen, the Satmar Hasidim grew over the next decades to become the largest Hasidic group, numbering today about 150,000 worldwide. Additionally, they have had an influence on the other Hasidic groups, many of whom have also maintained Yiddish, if not as consistently and ideologically as Satmar. <clears throat> Satmar's influence can also be felt at a purely linguistic level. Hasidic refugees came to, uh, to America from all over Europe, speaking different dialects of Yiddish. But most of today's Yiddish-speaking Hasidim have assimilated to the Hungarian Yiddish dialect of the Satmar, a convergence that may be called modern Hasidic Yiddish. Hasidim have created parallel social, ed educational, and economic institutions with, which allow them to lead lives separate from outside interaction and cultural influence. They have their own schools, uh, including kolels, which are educational institutions attended by married men, stores, and media sources, such as Yiddish newspapers and periodicals and plenty of music. And yes, it is possible to buy a Metro card in Yiddish. <laughs> Meanwhile, uh, consumption of outside media and the internet are strongly discouraged, and TV is forbidden. The demographics of Hasidim are extraordinary. Take Kiryas Yo, for example. The average household side, size is 5.8, compared to a national average of 2.5. More than half of the population is below the age of 14, the lowest median age in the country. The Hasidic population doubles every 15 to 20 years. Considering their meteoric population growth and success keeping assimilation at bay, it is easy to predict that Hasidim represent the future of Yiddish in America. However, although they already comprise the vast majority of those using Yiddish on a daily basis, Hasidim aren't the only ones to do so. After all, I'm not a Hasid, and neither are many of my Yiddish-speaking friends, such as the distinguished individuals depicted here. <laughs> the second group I'm going to talk about today are the Yiddishists. This term means something quite different today than it once did. The word Yiddishism was coined over a century ago by Nathan Birnbaum, the same person who invented the word Zionism. Back then, of course, Yiddish was the language of the Jewish masses, and Yiddishism was involved with raising the status of Yiddish, thereby raising the status of its speakers, and transforming the language into a vehicle of culture on a level with other national European languages. If today's Yiddishists are still concerned with raising the status of Yiddish, it has more to do with salvaging a component of our heritage than with galvanizing the Yiddish speakers of our day in a nationalistic plan. But with Yiddish passing increasingly out of vernacular use uh, among non-Haredi Jews, the use of Yiddish, even for everyday purposes, or perhaps especially for everyday purposes, is a matter of choice. Since I'm talking about Yiddish speakers, I'll define Yiddishists as those who use the language regularly, even when they could communicate as well, or even better, in a different language. They might do this for ideological reasons, social reasons, or just for the intellectual challenge. This group of people forms a type of linguistic community, although in a much looser sense than among the Hasidim. Although they share a common language and some aspects of cultural identity with Hasidim, in some ways they're more similar to other communities of interest, such as Esperantists, or for that matter, polyglots. For instance, the community spread out sparsely around the world is far less geographically concentrated than Hasidic enclaves. A Yiddishist might be one of the only Yiddish speakers in their city or neighborhood. But geography remains instrumental. The high concentration of Ashkenazi Jews in New York, for example, leads to possibilities not available in most other cities. Additionally, there's been a shift away from intergenerational continuity. Many Yiddishists learn the language in early adulthood 
and it's common for Yiddishists to speak more or better Yiddish than their parents. That said, I believe more value is placed among Yiddishists of speaking the language with their children than among Esperantists, for instance. And as in my case, family history often inspires the study of the language, even if it's not passed down directly from one generation to the next. The number of Yiddishists is not easy to estimate, as the US census only tracks languages spoken at home, making it impossible to di differentiate them from other Yiddish speakers. I estimate, I estimate that a couple thousand speakers worldwide are somewhat or fairly active in the Yiddishist community, about 1% of total Yiddish speakers. And although I speak to you as a representative of this community, I should clarify that I'm an exception, not the rule. Probably less than 100 people worldwide interact with the Yiddish world as the focal point of their social, professional, and family life. I'd like to take you on a short tour of the world of Yiddishists through the story of my own journey. I began learning Yiddish in 2004 when I was a junior in college in Santa Barbara, California. A linguistics professor of mine and mentor taught a beginner's Yiddish course that I joined. Interpolating numbers from an L MLA report, about 400 students around the US study the language that year as well. And in 2006, 26 institutions in the US reported offering Yiddish classes. Most of my Yiddish learning, though, was autodidactical, using these books. The first, College Yiddish, was written by Uriel Weinreich when he was only 20 years old and has remained the classic Yiddish textbook for adults since it was first published 65, <coughs> 65 years ago. This was not the edition I learned from. Otherwise, I would have been very surprised to find myself on the cover. The second, Yiddish Tzvei, or Yiddish II, was written by Mordechai Schechter, a Yiddish linguist, one of the few Eastern European Yiddishists whose children and grandchildren also speak Yiddish, and as I would soon discover, make up a formidable Yiddishist dynasty. I was lucky enough to have a Yiddishist aunt in New York City, and when I visit her the fo visited her the following summer, she wrote up a list of all the Yiddish people I had to meet and the institutions I had to visit. That week, I visited the Uriel Weinreich summer program. This is the oldest inten <coughs> intensive Yiddish summer program. The number of such programs has multiplied, and this summer there were programs in Vilnius, Paris, Warsaw, Tel Aviv, Amherst, and a second one in New York, which I'll discuss more at length in a couple minutes. As the number of college courses in Yiddish have been falling from year to year, these summer programs are becoming the primary way that young people from outside the Hasidic world uh, learn Yiddish, and thus are important gateways to the Yiddishist community. That same summer of 2004, I attended the Yiddish Vach, or Yiddish Week. The Yiddish Vach is the largest and oldest annual Yiddish language retreat, running every summer since 1976. It's grown significantly in size in the last couple decades, with an attendance of about 150 and has taken place in various locations, never more than a few hour drive from New York City. Because this retreat is so unique, many come from outside the US to participate. Jews there come from a variety of religious backgrounds, from secular to orthodox, and non-Jews who speak Yiddish are equally welcome. About 15% of participants are under 10 years old, and the median age is in the 30s, with a number of whole families attending together. There are a variety of, ac of activities, including sports, folk dancing, lectures and workshops, campfire singing, a talent show, concerts and films, as well as a separate program for children. Sometimes the activities are specific to Yiddish, like reading Yiddish literature. Sometimes they're related to Jewish culture, but not specific to the language. Almost all the activities are led by volunteers from the community of participants, and all are conducted entirely in Yiddish. In fact, everything from Aleph to Tov at the conference is in Yiddish. The registration form, the announcements, and of course, all the activities. Participants are expected to speak the language exclusively for the duration of the week. The Yiddish Vach was my first introduction to Yiddishists as a group. I found in general that they were welcoming of newcomers, patient with beginners, loved talking about language and grammar, and did not tend to switch to English. In other words, it was an ideal social situation to learn a new language. 
This was before I started learning many other languages, so I didn't realize how rare this was. Afterwards, people would be surprised when I, told, when I told them of all the languages I learned, including major world languages, it was easiest coming as an outsider to find people to talk to in Yiddish. The one downside is average proficiency level of the speakers. Even the relatively fluent Yiddishists might be a B2 or C1 on the CEF scale. Since so many are students of the language or heritage speakers that grew up in Yiddishist households, but are dominant in the official language of their country. And that actually makes it easier when you're starting out, but the relative paucity of C2 plus speakers means it takes more dedication to reach and maintain a very advanced level than it might be if you were learning a language in a foreign country. After college, I decided to move to New York City, in part because of the opportunities here to speak Yiddish. I found and helped create a small but active social life in Yiddish for people in their 20s. Yiddish students and native Yiddishists would gather either informally, like at this barbecue, or in slightly more formal events organize, organized by Jugendtruf, the same organization behind the Yiddishwach. Full disclosure, I'm on the board. A meetup might involve reading Yiddish literature together, singing folk songs, or just hanging out. This is a tour of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in Yiddish. Facebook and other online social networks now serve an important role in connecting Yiddishists in different parts of the world. But nothing can take the place of living in proximity to one another. And in 2010, we created a Yiddish hoiz, or Yiddish house, an apartment with three Yiddish speakers living together with the intention of fostering community and creating a space for Yiddish language get-togethers. Since then, I've lived with Yiddish speakers and have referred to my apartment as a Yiddish hoiz. At one point, this was our front door. <laughs> there are now several of these apartments in New York City and in Boston, and they're a site of planned and unplanned Yiddish interaction. One new initiative, remo remarkable among other reasons for being a point of contact between Hasidim and Yiddishists, is the Yiddish farm. This organic farm in upstate New York was co-founded four years ago by these two friends of mine. To some extent, out of frustration with the artificiality of the Yiddishist social scene in New York. The intention was to create a communal place where Yiddish would be spoken year round, not just here and there to get together, and where something beyond the language itself would serve to bring people together. Additionally, it was from the very start designed to be a coming together point between Yiddish speakers from both Haredi and more secular backgrounds. And its location, a short drive from Curious Yo, <clears throat> helps in this regard. It's the point marked green on the map. Here's a Hasidic rabbi planting a potato at the farm. <laughs> the farm creates more than just social connections with individual Hasidim. For instance, wheat grown at the farm is baked into matzah at a Satmar bakery. And Hasidim visit the farm as families or in groups as a form of entertainment or education. This is a group of 200 Hasidic grade schoolers who visited one day. Although the farm was originally envisioned as a place for people who are already fluent in Yiddish, it was soon realized that it could be the ideal locale for a Yiddish learning program. Over the past few summers, dozens of students have come to learn Yiddish at the farm in a completely immersive environment. In addition to several hours of class time every day, students also live, eat, and work together on the farm. Far, uh, far away from the distractions of city life. With a few exceptions where precise communication with the students is a necessity, English is prohibited from day one. The past decade has been one of increased interaction between some Hasidim and Yiddishists. The reasons are simple. On the one hand, the ever-increasing number of Hasidim and their increased exposure to the internet result in an increased number that become interested in the outside world. And every once in a while, with secular literature, music, or theater in their own language. This often leads to contact with those strange people that speak that language or some approximation thereof, and yet are not themselves Hasidic. Yiddishists, on the other hand, find themselves for the first time bereft of the presence of native speakers born in Eastern Europe before the war. 
as young le learners of the language search for speakers for whom Yiddish is the most natural form of expression, they find them most readily, especially in New York, among the Hasidim. The worlds are by no means colliding. Most Hasidim have probably never even heard of Yiddishists, and if they have, consider them heretics. Many Yiddishists still look askance at the Hasidim's wanton adulteration of their language with English borrowings and calques, at their non-standardized spelling and grammar. Nevertheless, the Yiddish farm provides at least one place where members of these two Yiddish lands can meet one another and hopefully gain from the encounter. Adank. Questions? Frages? <laughs> um, very wonderfully done in this talk, and uh, also uh, Yanko was my own Yiddish teacher. I was in the first generation of Yiddish farm. It's That's so strange it. speaking English to you for what is the <laughs> first time. <laughs> I'm curious what the situation of Yiddishists outside of the United States, primarily in Europe, Canada, Australia, and South America is concerned, and any other places I might have forgotten. Mm -hmm. Thank you, great question. Um, not living in those places, I know a little bit less about that, but um, the second most concentrated uh, place for Yiddish speakers would be Israel, I believe, uh, in certain neighborhoods in Jerusalem and Bnei Brak. Um, I don't have any numbers offhand of how many Yiddish speakers, but Yiddish, uh, I've heard, is perhaps decreasing proportionally among Haredi Jews in Israel, but still increasing in absolute numbers. Um, other populations are in Antwerp, as you might know, which I, I still have yet to visit, but I want to. Uh, there's also, and that maybe is a community of about um, 10, 20,000 Yiddish speakers. Uh, including, uh, and at least until recently, uh, it, was, it was called the last shtetl in Europe because uh, not only Haredi Jews there spoke Yiddish, but even the, uh, the more modern Jews, because there was a high proportion of, of Haredi speakers, would also speak uh, Yiddish, um, as well as many other languages. They're all very multilingual. Uh, there's also a, a Hasidic community in, near Montreal, and it's called Tosh. Um, and, uh, but if you're, uh, I don't know if you were specifically referring to Haredi or non Haredi, otherwise, I don't, I don't know, do you want specifics? Ah, sorry. Uh, let's see. Well, mm, I mean, like I said, Yiddish is kind of that, it's still a language where you can go to almost any place and find at least some Yiddishists. I go to Paris and hang out with Yiddish people there, or you can go to, I mean, in, Basically, everywhere I go, Israel, Russia, wherever it is, I end up speaking Yiddish most of the time because those are, those are the connections. Uh, I found an interesting situation when I went to Israel. Uh, I kept meeting people and, and speaking Yiddish the, the whole time, and everybody that I talked to would say, yeah, there's nobody to speak Yiddish with in Israel. It's really... Too bad. But, and yet I was speaking Yiddish with all of them. They just didn't know each other. And I think that the the um, it's it's not as much of a network as in New York, where it's concentrated and there are these all these events. I think it's more individualized. Um, but yeah, so I don't know if that answers your question. But it's basically you can find them everywhere. But it's uh, you know yeah. Mm. Hello. Yes. Um, I wanted to know, you mentioned that in Israel there is still a community of Yiddish speakers. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to know how that came to be after the repression of Yiddish in Israel. Um, as far as I understand it, it, it was kind of similar to in America, where assimilation is a very strong force, and yet some people are just so stubborn that it doesn't make a difference. And that's basically the case in Israel. I think, yeah, most, the vast, vast majority uh, switched to Hebrew as a result of a very strong pressure, um, both social and legal and so on. But some people are just really stubborn. I mean, uh, the Satmar don't recognize the state of Israel. They, they don't, another factor in the, in the language shift was when you accept money from the state, there's certain conditions that go along with them. Satmar refused to accept any money. so. They, they were able to you know, keep a little bit uh, more independent. And uh, yeah, I think it's just stubbornness, I don't know, and ideology. Uh. Hi, how you doing? Um, quick question. So 
don't know that much about Yiddish. Mm -hmm. um, so how tied is it to Judaism and religion as far as, or is it not, you know what I mean? Because I know most languages are Spanish or Italian. Maybe there's not like a religious aspect tied to it, but Yiddish it seems like there might be. How does that kind of play into it? And also, um, like what countries would you say speak most Yiddish? Good question. Thank Thanks. Um, yeah, it's interesting. It's, uh, you know, the Yiddishists, as y Yiddishist with the ist, uh, were historically pretty secular, I believe. Um, and some of them, some of them wanted to, for instance, uh, also get rid of that, that, tri you know, that trilingualism that I talked about, where Hebrew and Aramaic were very closely uh, tied, at least in a, you know, associationally with uh, the religion. And some of them wanted to be secular and even get rid of all the Hebrew words in Yiddish, try to, you know, de-Hebraicize Yiddish, um, and thereby de-religionize the language. Um, but yeah, so I think nowadays, at least I you know, can talk from a personal perspective, I, I think if you want to appreciate the language in its full uh, richness, I think it's basically impossible unless you're very well versed in all aspects of, of, Yid of Jewish life, including, um, yeah, including uh, texts, uh, religious texts and all these different things. Um, and that's part of why at the, at the Yiddish farm, unlike all the other uh, Yiddish programs, which are, which are quite secular, uh, at the Yiddish farm, there's um, it, uh, a traditional lifestyle to some extent, at least with regards to the, the Jewish law and things like that, uh, uh, is maintained. So everybody is, for instance, I don't know if you know what Shabbos is, the, the Jewish Sabbath, that's uh, maintained. There's no, you know, we don't work on the Sabbath. There's, there's prayers, which you don't have to... Uh, participate in, but you can, and so on. And it, the, the idea is to create a, a more holistic environment where you're kind of absorbing the Jewish way of life, and that is crucial to understanding, let's say, Jewish uh, Yiddish literature or things like that. Um, so yeah, hopefully that answers your question. Oh, and you asked also, uh, which countries you mean today? So like I mentioned, the, the New York metropolitan area is really the center, uh, the, the largest concentration. After that, there's Israel. Um, yeah, I mentioned Antwerp, and uh, uh, there's a few other uh, communities scattered around. Um, you mentioned the uh, Uriel Weinreich uh, program mm -hmm. and the Yiddish farm. Um, and when you mentioned that, myself and a couple people around me, our faces lit up. That sounds like a blast. Um, yeah. I was curious if you could talk a little more about that, if there are, you know, like uh, tuition fees and an application process. Um, uh, Stuff like that, if you could uh, talk about For just about for that. in general, yeah, there's about, uh, there's a handful of, of uh, intensive summer programs <clears throat> that go on every, every year. Um, yeah, they, they all involve tuition. There's often lots of stipends if, if you know, it's hard for you to afford. Uh, yeah, it's, you, you apply for it. It's like an academic <clears throat> program, so. Is there housing there? I think uh, for, it, it depends on the program. If you're, uh, sorry? Yeah, I mean, uh, some of the programs kind of leave you on your own. Like in Vilnius, I think you kind of have to find your own housing. And uh, and maybe in New York as well, though I think there's also like a dorm if you want, or you can live uh, anywhere in the city. Uh, at the Yiddish farm, of course, everybody lives together, sleeps together, not like that. And uh, <laughs> and and everything is, it all takes place on a very, very small, uh, you know, environment. So there it's, you know, I mean, you could take a hotel a few miles away, but, but usually people live on campus, uh, a 30 second walk from the classroom. Yeah. I was a little surprised yesterday when um, in one of the programs on indigenous languages, it was emphasized that several non-indigenous are leading the revival of indigenous languages. Um, uh, one of the um, non-Jewish uh, uh, Yiddish activists that I know, Tzvi Sedan in Israel, is also a leader of the Esperanto community. Could you expand on uh, uh, non-Jews who are, are uh, involved in uh, the uh, Yiddishist movement? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's interesting because Yiddishism from the beginning, I would say, was is is kind of 
has an outsider component, not so much from non-Jews, but from non-Yiddish speakers. Nathan Bierenboim was not a native Yiddish speaker. Max Weinreich was not a native Yiddish speaker. They, they spoke German at home. Uh, and, that, and that was the case for a, a fair number of, of Yiddishists. And uh, there's something about that. I guess I'm not sure what it is, but uh, I guess coming maybe if it's not you know the environment the, the language of your entire environment you kind of can feel the the preciousness of it a little bit more and uh definitely especially uh, outside america there's a lot of non-jews uh when, when i go to paris um i remember one one friday night it was quite interesting we had like a sabbath meal that i that i led uh, there were about 10 people in the room only two were jews everybody was from a different country uh, it was it was quite an experience, and um, so yeah, it's th there's definitely you know, it, uh, and sometimes uh, there's an interesting you know there can be a reaction from from Jews that I've heard about at least, where it's like but but I'm Jewish, I'm allowed to ignore my language. What are you doing learning it? <laughs> um, but you know, but I think uh, I think in general among uh pretty much happy for for anybody to take an interest in the language and uh you know one one yiddish uh, that i know in paris made the metaphor of like you know it's like a, a piece of furniture a nice piece of furniture that you have in your apartment and then you put it on the street you get rid of it and then somebody else comes by and looks at it and you know thinks it's nice so kind of like that uh, hello um i had a question as the goal of the Yiddishist movement, is there any thought long term about this is not just a linguistic community, but a kind of a revival of Yiddish guided with the literature, the reviving kind of a living, breathing culture beyond just just speaking among a few members? Uh, if you mean if by living and breathing, I mean, we're all, li I mean, I'm living and breathing, I think. <laughs> Take my pulse. Um, but if you mean a mass movement, uh, you have to be a little um, delusional to, I mean, just honestly speaking, to, to think that it's going to become the mass, I mean, unless you look statistically at the demographics of, of Hasidim, then you're not so delusional um, in thinking they might be the majority of, of Jews in the area uh, within the century. But um, in terms of a Yiddishist movement expanding and, and taking mass, I mean, it's it's inherently a thing, I mean, in order to to make the decision to speak a language that's completely different, that you don't, and not completely different, but that you didn't grow up with. And, and, um, and part of the problem is that, I, I think, uh, I'll put it, I'll say this, I think, um, non-delusionally, I think that uh, part of the hope is at least that there will be a wider uh, appreciation of Yiddish as a key component of our heritage. I think that the, um, what's it called, the, uh, the Meadea, the, uh, uh, I forgot the word. Um, okay, whatever. <laughs> you know, this thing. <laughs> the, uh, the, the, the powers that be, or whatever it's called, the, what? No, okay, whatever. <laughs> yeah, 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 anyway. Uh, they, it's not part of the, uh, the, not administration, ugh. Um, of of uh, of of uh, mainstream J uh, Jewish uh, education. Uh, it's I, I went to to, to uh, Jewish day school for for 13 years. I went in New York, in Israel, in California. Never taught anything about Yiddish. Never heard anything about Yiddish. Never learned anything about their history, about their literature, about songs or words or zilch. Even though I was spending half of my day every single day learning uh, Jewish studies for 13 years. So. It's just, it's, uh, it's not part of, you know, it's become, it's like a mass uh, amnesia. Uh, and I think, it, I, I personally, I think it, uh, it's kind of like a post-traumatic uh, stress uh, syndrome kind of thing from, from the Holocaust and other reasons. But um, it's basically we've forgotten about that whole part of our history and of our, our culture. And I think we at least want to see at least people learning a little bit of Yiddish. Maybe it won't become... Uh, you know, there won't suddenly become writers in the language. I mean, that's that's a pretty far step to learn a language so well that the, you know that there's writers or new things like that. But at least to be able to appreciate it, I think, is definitely part of the the goal. I, I'm being told we're very short on time now. By the way, uh, I just wanted to ask quickly 
uh, my understanding was the Klal standard Yiddish, uh, not based on the same Hungarian uh, version of the Hasidish, but uh, seeing a lot more Hasidish Yiddish on the internet now, and you're talking about interactions sometimes between the Yiddish communities. I was wondering if you thought there was any sort of linguistic conversion of the two that was either happening now or likely to happen? Mm -hmm. Like I said, the worlds are not colliding. I think uh, Hasidim are pretty, m are, you know, going to keep speaking the way they're speaking. Yiddish is kind of like the, 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 you know, the, the Yiddish that they've inherited straight from Europe. The Hungarian Yiddish, part of the problem, you could say, has to do with that uh, Hungarian Yiddish made very, very, had very little influence on the formation of the standard Yiddish in Europe. It was just kind of like a backwater place. Nobody paid attention to it, and it wasn't part of, of that form. So they did turn out to be a little bit different. Um, yeah, I think you know it, it's on an individual level. Hasidim that have, that 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 are uh, have ca uh, contacts with uh, with Yiddishists tend to start using their words, or at least the words from the literature, things like that, and their Yiddish does change. Conversely, Yiddishists that, that hang around with Hasidim definitely start using their slang and, and phrases and things like that. Uh, whether that will spread outwards is, is anybody's guess, but definitely for those people who have the direct contact, there's definitely a linguistic uh, convergence, yeah. Ashenem Dank Yanko. Thank you.